absolutely not friendly to advertisers. All right, we are live. We are live. I am with Mark Herman extraordinaire. Uh, we've got a, a famous board game designer, author, professor, lecturer. Uh, let's see, what a, a award winner. I got Charles S. Roberts Awards. You've got it for post-World War II uh, with uh, We the People, and then you've got World War II with Empire of the Sun. Um, also working for, and I've got to look, is it is it Bose Allen Hamilton? Did I say the first name? Who's Allen Hamilton? But Ooh. I retired from there uh, uh, almost four years ago. Oh, wonderful. All right. I'm game uh, these days. I know, and then going back in history, we've got, uh, I liked, uh, I was on your uh, your blog where you have, uh, I think, original member of SPI Grognard Division. Love yeah. that. Of course, and this is the first time I ever heard or saw your name. I was about 13 or 14, and it was with Victory Games. <laughs> Fly Ramp Games, yeah, that was, uh, that was a, it was a good time. Uh, you know, it was a young father and running a company. It was, it was really kind of cool times. Well, thank you. Uh, anything, uh, I'm, I'll let the folks know. We've got, um, so far, just scarecrows in here. We'll see if anybody else pops in. A lot of times I'll, uh, oh, and then uh, it says Judd, or no, S.U. Park wants to know if Judd's in the house. He's not in my house. Says he snuck into yours. <laughs> I, I, tell you, I you, know, I actually got to meet Judd, and he's just a, he's a really nice guy. Uh, he's got a great daughter, uh, Sarah, uh, helped me with an unboxing. I mean, literally, they came over. I had him come over here and, you know, she was a, you know, what I liked about Sarah was she's like, what is she, like 12? It was like a 12 year old girl the way I remember 12 year old girls. You know, just, you know, city kids are very different. Yes. They grow up faster. But when you see the kids from the Midwest, you go, oh, I remember, I remember you and everybody like you when I was a kid. And she's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, how about anything, uh, what have I missed or, or, uh, you know, intro yourself on anything else that, uh, that I didn't, uh, properly intro you on? I, let me tell you something. I, you did fine. I, <laughs> so, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what else to do. I'll, so what have I been doing lately? So what I've been doing over the last five days is I finally, Fort Sumter is actually done. So, uh, I just did the last edit this morning. And, I, and my wife, I guess the one thing I would tell people is that the one thing my wife said to me is, I don't think people realize how much work goes into finishing a game. You know, doing a game is one thing, but finishing it and actually publishing it, I think I've put in over the last week 80 hours working on the, rule, you know, the rules and the playbook to finish them up. I mean, it's just amazing how many I've checked it and everything. And I, you know what the worst part is? I know that there's a correction that I missed that's mocking me, and I'll see it two seconds after it's in the box, I'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Now, now that's one thing I did leave off. You've published 70-plus games, and when I was looking at the years they're that coming out. Count them all. Okay, 70? Yeah, 70 plus. I think I was at, I saw one list where if, if I was thought 71 or 72 that I was looking at. That sounds about right. I, I, I don't sit around like, counting them like gold or anything, but, you know. Sure. Sure, but I mean, uh, more games I am years alive, so I'm I'm ahead. I'm 63, 71. I'm good. <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, and we and I kind of have a few touchstones that I'll come yeah. I'll come back to a couple times, but I'll also let people know. Um, Mark's also a big fan of uh, Scotch. Uh, some of you know I've got a whiskey channel called uh, Scotch Dust Dummies. But uh, Mark sampling a Balvenie. You actually have the 12 year Double Wood. Is that right? That's exactly what I'm drinking. Yeah. Beautiful. I've got I've got a peated seventeen year here that a fan had sent us. So I drink the twelve because the twelve costs in New York City about uh, anywhere from sixty eight to seventy six dollars in New York. That seventeen or the I I haven't seen the seventeen, but the eighteen goes for like three twenty five. Wow. Yeah, I know. So I drink the twelve. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, that the uh, the gift of the seventeen. I we couldn't get the seventeen year in Kansas. And we had uh, some just some great fans of the show that that sent two of these, one for me and one for Scott, my co-host on the Scott Show, and you know I, we, were, we were blown away. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm drinking an Ardbeg Dark Cove, and this is their committee release, which is a little more limited, a little stronger. It's a cast strength, and uh, I'm a big peat head, so that's what I've got in my uh, little Riedel glass here, cognac glass. So we'll be a little distracted with that as the night goes on. Absolutely. I do have my chat screen up. Okay. Uh, there's a few coming in. Let me take a look. 
Wow. First of all, we've got Danny in here. And uh, he's actually a big fan on the Scott show, and he's come on over for this. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. He's got a more of a whiskey question. Let's see. Uh, we've got SU Parks says, newer gamer here. Enjoy Command and Color Systems, Academy Game Titles from Uva, obviously. Which of your titles, which of your titles, Mark, would you recommend? Empire of the Sun sounds amazing, but he thinks it may be beyond him. Yeah, I would say that, look, it, I have found that folks, first off, if he plays, it's not a matter of, um, of brain power, okay? And complexity has nothing to do with that. You can play you know, command and college, you can play anything. The question really is, is where, where do your interests lie? I've seen folks who picked up their first war game was squad leader, and they just love the topic and they figured it out. You know, they're just smart enough. It's not, so I find that topic is more important to whether you'll stick with a, any game than not. So if he likes Ancients, I would say that, you know, he might have a better time with my Great Battles of History series, because that's more ancient, that's my Ancients games. He wants, you know, so, but if he's interested in the Pacific, uh, yeah, Empire of the Sun will do it, but I would tell him also that if you want to, and again, it's it's exactly the same rules, but it's a lot less to manage. Is look at the C3I South Pacific, because it's Empire of the Sun, if you can, if you can deal with that, but it's obviously... Well, first of all, Empire of the Sun's not in print, so right now I think it, it hasn't made the cut yet for the next reprint, but it's not in print anyway, so you know you, you probably pay too much on the aftermarket. I would never advise that. But uh, South Pacific, which is exactly uh, Empire of the Sun, but it's a much you know it's a 11 by 17 map. It's a very constrained scenario. A lot of people have told me that even though it's the same rule set, by not having the breadth of the war, it kind of it's like, okay, I got Guadalcanal, I got New Guinea, I can just deal with with that. And that makes the, the system more accessible, not because it's a different system, because you don't have the 800 other decisions you might be able to make. By cutting down the decisions, it becomes more manageable. But I would say that that's still available and in print. So take a look at see, though, the Roger McGowan's, they sell them on Amazon. I think it was C3I 30. It's 30 or 29, I can't remember. But you can find it. it's called South Pacific, and I think that may be the better way. Also, much less expensive, and it's in print, so that's that, that may be the way to go. Now, and looking at look, the other one, looking at your wall of games, and I think I'm seeing are, are the uh, I don't know if those are folios or those SPI games that are all in the uh, the bags. Oh no, that so that's us. So I have until recently, I have every strategy and tactics magazine. So what you're looking at, you know, strategy and tactics low number up on the top shelf going across and so on and so forth. I get into my first, what was it, number 61 was October War. So that's when I enter the, you know, the, the stream of, of that for a while. But uh, no, that's my, those are all my magazine games there. Uh, you know, the CDGs are, you know, how good this is. There's like the CDG. Uh, I think that you can see all the CDGs there and, there's just a ton of stuff and, you know, watching football in the background there, of course. Now, just to go back in time, sure. what leads you into designing in the first place and getting hired at, at SPI? Uh, that story. Um, so I was a gamer and the first origins was held in Baltimore. The first two origins were held in Baltimore. I was a... Fresh, well, I guess I had finished my freshman year. I was going to be a sophomore in college. And I went up to the SPI booth, and I said, how do you become a game designer? I mean, literally, you know, I, you know, I was a history major. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life at that point, like most kids. And, um, you know, so this guy, Howie Barish, who was the head of their marketing, and more, more like the business manager of the place, he was very nice and a really good guy. And he said, you know, start showing up on Friday nights, play test games, let us get to know you, et cetera. And so... For the rest of college, I, when I could, I was out in Stony Brook, you know, I was about an hour and a half from the city. I forget about where that is, but it was in eastern Long Island, and New York City is west of where I was. And, um, you know, I had a car, and on Friday nights, I, every so often, I would drive into the city, play test, and I got to know people. And, you know, when I graduated college, I called them up, and they needed a, their receptionist had just resigned. So I got the receptionist job in SPI, and that's how I got into the game business. Hmm. 
See, I find that to me that's that's intriguing. What year did you start then at SBI? Are we talking I started September first, nineteen seventy six. Beautiful, beautiful. And then yeah, I used to be a bill collector before that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I worked for a you, you had to see this. I worked for a newspaper called Dan's Papers, and I, you can't see it, but I'm, I'm like. Remember, this is me, not now, as an old man, but this is me at 21. I was uh, six foot one, 200, and, you know, not an ounce of fat on me. And I used to, I got these mirror shades, and Dan's papers are like a free newspaper. And, you know, you go to like to a 7 Eleven and they have a pile of them, and it has, and it has advertising. And so this guy had. A lot of advertising people weren't paying, you know, these are summer people and they don't pay their bills. And I was his bill collector. And I used to go around collecting his advertising debts for him. And it was hysterical. And I used to wear these mirror shades. I had wild, crazy red hair, uh, <laughs> tons of it. And I had, did I have a mustache? I might have, no, I didn't have a mustache. I might have a mustache and a beard at some point. I can't remember what, what part I, what I was phasing through. And it was hysterical, and I and I had a basic rule: as soon as I collected ten thousand dollars, I was off for the day. So he had about three hundred thousand dollars owed to him. And by the end of the summer, I had collected about a you know close to a quarter million of it. Wow! I learned how to put liens on property, and I've had Doberman pinchers set on me, and all the. Things. <laughs> now, did you get a commission of that, or were you straight fee? You know, I had been a I was a gardener before that. And it was a very rainy summer, so the idea that I was actually getting a paycheck. That had more than three dollars in it was really so exciting. <laughs> I was probably making I was making maybe I don't know hundred dollars a week, hundred twenty dollars a week. No, no commission. Now that is a good story because that's what I'm. I would. There's some things I'm intrigued about, but if you've got any rabbit trails you want to go down at all, please, <laughs> please do so. Well, I, I I always found it. You know, you have to know me. I'm, I mean, I'm a gentle giant. I I mean, yes, I can be. If, if somebody hits me or does something like physical to me, I know what to do, but I was born in Brooklyn, you know, so you just not how to do, you know, take care of yourself, but sure. people can curse at me and yell at me and I won't react to that. That, that, I just kind of like look at you like, how stupid do you think I am? But remember at the end of the summer, Dan, who was, uh, I was going to go to this job at SPI, that's how I, I said I'm quitting, I'm going to go work for this game company, and he really liked me, he was, oh, is it a money thing? I'll, I'll put you up. I have an apartment. I'll, you know, he's really, he, I was making him money, right? Mm -hmm. And it cost him nothing, but uh, he's a nice guy. He said, the only thing is, a lot of people tell me you're, you're very scary. And I found that to be the <laughs> <laughs> And I never touched anybody, by the way. I know, I mean, I, you know, I'd walk into these places. But I'll tell you the best story I have, and I, I learned a lot from this. So this guy had a, um, like, I don't know, it was like a, it was a girl's clothes thing, right? And there was this little mini mall in Southampton, and it's the building is like in amongst all these other stores, but it's all glass, four sides of glass. And it's got racks of clothes, you know, what you see. And then the changing room was the only part that didn't have glass all four sides. Sure. So I go to this guy, and, you know, I kept going and saying, look, you owe Dan, you know, whatever, X amount of dollars. I want, I need to check. You, and then, you know, give me, you get the first excuse. You know, Dan took some shirts, so then you had to go and, like, rectify the bill, right? Then you got the honest, and they go, oh, the accountant's not here. I don't have the checkbook. That's the other baloney story. But now, if I get to the point now, I go to the guy. He goes, look. He says, on my mother's grave, tomorrow at noon, I will pay you. Fine. Come back at noon the next day. There is not, all there is is glass. There's not a thing in the store. He's gone. <laughs> Holy moly. I was really, the only thing that was on the floor was a couple of hangers. I mean, so, so between noon on one day and noon the next day, he was gone. I mean, there was nothing in the store. It was hysterical. I said, oh, is, I have been had. <laughs> now, see, I'm 6'6", six, six, and I weigh in, I'm probably about 240. And uh, on the board game side, everybody knows what I do. Uh, I'm in law enforcement, so it's always come in handy. But just recently, one of our public information officers who used to work for me when he was new yeah. pulled me aside because he's been on a few years now, and he said, you know, when I worked for you, I found you intimidating. I'm like, what? Because I'm always joking around. I'm six, 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 six. Yeah. And I said, you're kidding me. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I never even felt comfortable telling you, but he goes, it was all over one incident. And I said, I actually know the exact incident you're talking about. So one thing I'll tell you, and this is a rule, whether you're in law enforcement or not, you never win a fight with a naked dude. I'm just telling no. you. No. <laughs> 
all right? And I've had a few naked dudes in traffic, all right? Usually we've got some kind of obviously drugs going on here, but we had a guy on one of our highways and he's naked and he's running in traffic and we're talking, uh, there's no slowdowns. So we're at speed 60, 65, 70. He's gonna get killed. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna get killed and we're gonna have all kinds of stuff. Well, sure enough, a couple of my guys uh, find him they're, they're trying to shut down the street and grab him all at the same time. And he's uh, a naked guy who's on drugs and sweat. He's just, it's just not a good combination anyway. Right. Right. Getting a grease pig, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's exactly right. So I show up and the, the thing I'm worried about this, we've got enough people here. We can't really contain this guy because he's just wigging out, but we've got traffic just, you know, there's always an idiot that doesn't realize what's going on or they're distracted by the lights and they're zooming by at 65, seven miles an hour. So I told this guy and another officer, shut down all traffic. Just shut it all down. I don't care if we back it up until we get this guy bundled in a car and get out of here. They were trying to bring in a certain van to, to put this guy in. I said, no, screw all that. Jump in the car. I don't care if you can't get all the cuffs on or whatever. You're going to sit in there with him, pin him down. We're going to get the hell out of here. And uh, no sooner did they shut it down than, boom, here comes some truck doing 65 comes through. And I spun around and I'll clean it up, but you can throw in the, the uh, basically the F-bomb with, with no uncertain terms. I said, uh, when I say shut down traffic, I mean shut down traffic now. But I said it a lot more directly. Yeah, right. And they all proper feeling into it. Right, yeah, and, they, and they, they shut it all down. We got the guy bundled up, we got out of there. And I never thought too much about it because it had nothing to do personally with the individuals. It just had, hey, the only way this scene gets bad is but some car comes road. Yeah, some car comes through at 65 miles an hour and hits six of us. We're screwed. I mean, you're talking a real bad night. So, um, but yeah, he'd held that. And I'm like, well, you realize the gravity. It wasn't personally. He said, no, I get it. It was just, it, it was my size and everything else. And I usually don't go around in a domineering attitude. And it was whoop. And it was. Yeah, but when things are going down, somebody's got to take charge and you got to like get it going. Otherwise, and yeah, the is the, the whack job is probably still alive because of all that, which is the right outcome. Right. And That's nobody awesome. got, yeah. I guess it was the guy. He got himself in a bad place and hopefully yep. in a better place. Yep. We got him out of there. We got our guys out of there. We slowed traffic down. We went the wrong way to get out of there just because that was the easiest exit route. I told the guys, turn on your lights, own the road. Let's get the heck out of here. And we'll have the special vehicle meet us at a, you know, point B or whatever, but that's my rabbit trail. Um, so victory games. Sure. You, I know TSR comes in, buys SPI. Um, you know, I know uh, they were kind of running roughshod. No, they didn't, well, I, I think I wrote, they didn't buy them. What they did was SPI was, you know, so the reason you've been in business at any time, what you find out is the only thing that matters is cash flow. And cash flow just means, I got more money coming in out the door in the door than I got to pay out to my employees and my bills. And once you go upside down, you know it's just a matter of time before you know you run out of you know dough and you're done. And uh, so we were in that situation, and um, I was running this little government. I had come back. And I was running this government division. So when you work for the government, you know they pay their when they pay their bills they're a little bit late, but they always pay their bills, and you get paid for. You know the cost. I mean, they pay properly, right? But the other parts of it, you know, the retail guys weren't paying their bills, and you know, it just goes on and on. So TSR comes in, and I guess there was a loan. You know, they loaned us money, and you know, a lot of you know, they talked to the staff, and it was all smiles and you know, whatever. But the reality was, as soon as we continued to have problems, they was they took over the company. You know, they secured the loan against like the company, and they just took it, and it, it didn't take long. This was like. And the time of the loan to the shutdown was like in weeks, you know, so this was not like it was a long term. They didn't suffer very long and all that. And, you know, like I said, I, I sat down with, there was two Bloom brothers. One was the older one and then one was the younger one. I think I met them both at the same time. And then the younger one left and they more or less said to me, you know, you're going to love Lake Geneva. You're leaving New York city and you're going to work for us. And I was like, Oh, well, thank you very much. You know, I never, <laughs> I, 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 I never get mad. I just getting mad is not the thing I do. Sure. I just kind of went, okay, thank you very much for your, I'm so happy that you want me. I appreciate that. I shook your guys hand and I went out and basically started cutting the deal. It became victory games. Beautiful. Yeah. And everybody, you know, like 
you can't own people. You can own, you can, you know, you want the inventory, knock yourself out. You want the, but you don't own me. Yes. I'll go, I'll go do something else. But anyway, we started Victory Games and it was a great experience. I mean, it, it had its, you know, in, you know, one of the things you got to do when you get older, you got to remember that, you know, in the, in the, in your golden years, you don't want to remember things in your past that everything was really great. You know, the other thing is you forgot the bad stuff. You remember the good stuff or, so, I mean, it was, there were some tense times, you know, a lot of personalities, but very, very talented people. And we turned out some really great games and we did, we did a lot more right than wrong. And, 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 and the guy, the, the guy that really gets the big credit or should get the big credit, he's recently deceased is uh, Eric Dot of Monarch Avalon. He was, he was a, a real no kidding businessman. Mm. And I learned a lot from him on that side, but he was a businessman, and so that everything worked because somebody knew what the hell was going on. <laughs> you know, we sell it for this much, we make this much back. You know, you know, buy low, sell high. I mean, real basic stuff. I mean, he was a smart guy, and I learned a lot from him. And so we were able to do games yet still make a lot of money. And I think uh, you had told—I think it was Judd that told me this. You mentioned that one of your—I don't know if it's your editors that really went through rule books or designed rule books, but he was a—he was. A, oh, what was it again? His name is Robert Robert J. Ryer. Robert Ryer. He's on all the rule. You look at any of the Victory Rule books. He's there. He's an old friend. He's he's a brilliant editor. Yeah. And he that format and the whole look and feel. You know, you, I told you everybody there was very talented. You know, we had great editors. We had great artists. You know, we had amazing designers, and uh, and then they had me. You know, <laughs> so sitting on top of this thing. And somehow I didn't screw it up too bad. <laughs> well, on that, we've got some questions that came oh, in. Some questions. Let me scroll back up here because I saw some great ones coming in. Let's see. Uh, uh, Tom uh, Sakur wants to know uh, what are your personal favorites or most enjoyable games? Ones that I did or not other did not do. Um, you know, he didn't get specific. So, and I know you you still enjoy playing uh, like Empire of the Sun. I was reading your blog where you'll still game at that. Well, it's set up right now down the uh, there end of this room. Perfect. Yeah, so um, I would say that if you were to say, like, what was my favorite game that I set up, you know, on a regular basis, it's – so there was this company called ICE. It, it stood for something, uh, but uh, I period, C period, E period. And they mostly were a – it was like a role – you know, they did kind of more fantasy, but they did this one game called Manassas, hmm. which is Battle of Manassas, first Manassas, fabulous – Two map tactical, you know, regimental level, gun battery level, where you create, and I love that game. That's that's like one of my favorite games. I also like the original first version of La Batalla de la Moscova, which is the La Batalla system. And I'll tell you a quick story for your, you know, for the folks like listening. So, I go to the first Origins, and remember, this is a long time ago. My budget, I'm in college. My total budget for buying stuff is fifty dollars. I got fifty dollars to buy games. And that's all the money I got. Otherwise, I'm not going to eat, you know, that kind of thing. And I walk into it, and right away, there's this guy named Larry Groves, who was one of the original creators of all the Thai system, and he's got this format for Dino game getting out there. And I'm like, and I'm, you know, at this time, I was really, really like Napoleon. I mean, I do two now. I mean, you guys just did a hand tag video. Yes, yeah. Greg Schmickens was teaching me and Judd how to properly say Bordino. Yeah, there you go. And uh, I'm just putting the plug in. I, although it's got plenty of power, but I'm just putting the plug back into my computer. Sure. Uh, so this guy, Larry Gross, and it's battalion level for Dino. And I'm like, oh, I'm, so I basically blow my whole budget. I'm, I'm in the hall for all of like eight minutes and I buy this game. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gamer for you. I mean, I just like, like I said, this is the game I've been waiting for my whole life at that point. So. Uh, and what's very important is it's mimeograph rules. I think that the rules of that game it become much more quote unquote micromanaged. You know, I don't want to say the word realistic because I don't think that even applies. It's got it went up by orders of magnitude micromanagement. I only play the original one because mm. it's like when you do a big game, four maps and all those counters, you got a big canvas. You don't want to be figuring out whatever happened. You want things to move, otherwise it, it's going to bog down into these little, and some people love that. I hate that. But so the original one just really moves. You can play, it moves pretty fast for a big game. Uh, and so consequently, 
Larry, so I'm, I'm running around doing things, and then Larry that finds me and goes, hey, why don't we set up a game of Borodino and just play it? So I spend the rest of the weekend playing Borodino. I mean, I remember, I'm, you got to remember, I'm like 19 or 18. I think I'm 18 at the time. So I'm just playing play straight for, for two days. And I'll never forget, so now it's about, it's like, say, it's sad. It's probably Sunday morning now, about 3 o'clock in the morning. And word's gotten around that these crazy guys are in this back room playing this gigantic game. And there were no monster games at this period of time. Everything was like one map game. And this guy, Richard Berg, walks in. Sure. And first time I ever met him. And we're talking. And that was what led to SPI starting a monster game thing. It's just that literally that connected to TSS based on that experience. And then we became really great friends, you know, and co-authors and all that years later. But I first met him. I was 19. I'm 18. And I'm playing this Robert Ty game with Larry Groves. It was just a great time. And so that's one of my favorite games. I, I thought the backstory was worth to hear. Oh, I love it. And now another, what's another? I mean, I, I like so many games, but I mean, I think about the ones I keep coming back to uh, is that, and funny, those, they're both well, still, you know, tactical 19th century games. Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously I like, I really like, uh, you know, some of the games I've done that I play a lot, so I'm, I'm not going to go into that. You know, but obviously I like my own cooking, so that's not a surprise. Uh, I've liked, I like many of the CDGs that have come out. Oh, another great game, a guy named uh, uh, Renaud Verloc, uh, who I actually game with. Uh, Age of Napoleon is one of the best one-map Napoleon games, I think, of all time. I love that game. Hmm. That's a real favorite of mine. Uh, and it's what's funny is I don't really like Napoleonic games as much as I like Civil War games, but anyway. Um, but I really like that game. And um, yeah, that's a top three, right? I know you guys do five, so yeah, I don't know. Like, well, you're good. Uh, uh, you're good. Right? You know, I'll be, I'll be uh, half ham head, right? You know, half is half is <laughs> half of a half. Much twice as good. Three times as bad. I don't know. Yeah, now you're three, yeah. <laughs> now, now, on that note, Greg Schmitkins is in here, and he has a, a question kind of in a similar vein. What was the hardest game for Mark to design, and uh, which design are you most proud of? Oh, wow. Hardest game to design. Actually, the hardest game to design was probably We the People. Uh, because I, I finished, I mean, I finished We the People, and I threw it all away and did it over again. So that's a lot of work. Really? And the second version is the one that got, you know, is the CDG version. Uh, that's what I was going to wonder, because you actually create that entire mechanic. Yeah, but it wasn't what I was trying to do. So I want to be clear. You know, CDG, you know, Gene Billingsley of uh, GNT Games, he makes all these, you know, he's a marketing guy. You know, he, he's, a good, he's a really good designer. I mean, great designer, actually. But he, he's got that, like, je ne sais quoi for these kind of, like, the Fort Sumner game is like a lunchtime game. I mean, I wouldn't think of that stuff. That's not how I think about things. But what... Um, I was trying to do was I was trying to represent the American Civil War as a low-level insurgency, mm. and area control of the colonies was more about the hearts and minds. It was a hearts and minds game, and the cards were almost, you know, everybody. I, I just heard a podcast the other day, and they were talking about their definition. See, everybody, because it's called a card-driven game, they focus on the cards. The cards are actually only one third of a card driven game in my mind. The, the, the next third is that it's it's about um, the it's a Paul Mill thing. So the political piece is how does the cards interact with the map? And I don't hear that in anybody's definition. They just forget about that. That's to me is probably the most important part. So um, we the people is an area control colony game. And you know of course people uh, talk about Twilight, you know, Twilight Struggle came far more, you know, it's a phenomenal game, and it's the one that everybody's famous on, but it's taking those same mechanics and just using it in a theme that people understood, and they did a, much, they did a phenomenal job with it, no, no, no question about it, but that area control mechanic is in We the People, and that's really the bigger piece of it. And then the third piece was the, the military being suborned to the political. Mm -hmm. In other words... It's not a, you could play a whole game of We the People and not even have a battle sometimes. I mean, it's rare, but you know, you wouldn't have many, which is really what happened. The first version I threw away, by the way, was sort of like a 1776 version. And, you know, I love 1776, and that's what I was kind of, 
but it, it wasn't the American Revolution as I started researching. So I, you know, I kind of backed into because um, everything I do, I never try. It, it, going back to Greg's point, what's the hardest game? The biggest problem I have with my designs to the general market is I'm doing a game each time based on what I'm doing a game on. I don't. I'm not trying to copy. You know, I might be using some pieces of other games. I've done so many games. You said 71, and I'll take your word for it. Um, I'm using things that are very bespoke, you know, the term bespoke. I do bespoke games. And as a consequence, like Pericles just came out, so Greg's asking which one. You know, I'm, I'm always proud of my last game that I just did. I mean, that's really, you know, but I'm very excited about Pericles, but people will say Pericles is complex. And I look at them, and I go, why? And the answer is because it's nothing like they're used to. It's complex not because they have nothing to grab. There's no, like, they, they go, oh, it's a worker placement game. No, it's not a worker placement. You know, there's nothing to grab onto. You got to grab onto it. Sure. And all people these days are looking for a different gamer experience. But I will say, where I my philosophy on game design is that I want people playing my games 15 years after I do them, and that's that's been holding up. And yeah. so, please, I think is going to have very long legs, just like Churchill. Everybody, I mean, I got this huge negative, you know, very positive response, but a very big negative response. Well, I think Churchill is becoming more popular now than it was when it first came out. Hmm. Because people are now starting to get it, you know, because it's it's not so new anymore. You know, they, they played it enough time. They go, oh, I see what's going on here. And so, and Empire of the Sun, when it came out, people were screaming, this game sucks. And But if you go on BGG, it's one of the few games whose rating continues to go up since it came out. That's very rare on BGG. So I think that that, to me, is what I call success. So going back to Greg's question, and, and Carol says hi, by the way, Greg. Uh, uh, she remembers she calls him the button guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's button famous and beef jerky. Well, I don't know about the beef. Yeah, he, I don't eat beef jerky. He's, he's offered to me several times. I've turned him down. But the, uh, but the buttons, I have many of his buttons. But um, the hardest one was that. Uh, but the, my favorite game right now is I still like Empire of the Sun. Uh, I just, I, I just, I hadn't played for. I really like for the people. I like um, Pericles. I think those are my top three of the games that I've done. Although when I look back, Pacific War is a, you know, a lot of fun, and France Forty Four is going to get redone. So you know, who knows? There you go. I've got France Forty Four sitting there. Doug by himself re, 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 re uh, brought that game back from the grave by himself. <laughs> Jud, Judd will be happy. Judd is the one that turned me on to it and was just yeah. singing its praises. Um, on the same, let's see, sorry, we had a comment and then I joggled my uh, list here. So let's see, uh, Trey Kaliva, Kaliva, sorry, would, uh, would Mark ever consider doing a re-implementation of Gulf Strike? Oh, you know, so I've got this problem. <laughs> <laughs> when you work in the, you know, when you work, I work for, you know, over the course of my career, I've probably put in over 30 years in the Pentagon. So the problem I've got is I don't want to screw up and put something in a game that shouldn't be in a game. Wow. Now that is intriguing. You have me now. Yeah. So I have sort of created a rule for myself that I'm not going to do games beyond Vietnam because I just, you know, I'm unlike – you know, some of the politicians out there, I, I do not, I take those things very seriously. Funny story. Uh, I was in this very, very, you know, crazy army program. And, and it's got like very limited slots. And after I did my work, they said, they're going to read me out. And you'll appreciate it. So I go into this room and this, um, this army sergeant walks in. And I didn't see, he had something, but I, and they're going to debrief me. All of a sudden, out the moment, this baseball cap comes swinging down on the table and slams into this metal table. And he goes, you just forgot everything you ever knew. I go, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I was now signing this piece of paper. I was right out of the program. <laughs> <laughs> I was hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That was so funny. <laughs> now, see, now, see, that's one of the best answers to a question, though, because – you know, I, I had a uh, – before I got into law enforcement, I was headed that way. I, I, out in Colorado, I had a buddy that was on the sheriff's department, and he'd been a uh, SP with the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, the first Iraq war kicked up, they brought him back and he'd been out for like three or four years. And he just said, I got to go. And I thought, well, that's an odd, I was a medic in the army. I thought, how's he getting pulled back in after that long? Well, when he comes back, he had been one of the SPs that had been on the stealth fighter throughout his whole active duty career. So they brought back all those guys. And then of course they went public so he could then talk about it. Yeah. So I was on that program before that. I, I worked many, many years for DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, for those who don't know what DARPA is. DARPA, love it. And um, it was called Have Blue when I worked on it. That was became the F-117. Wow. But, yeah, and, and, and I was running a war game in the Pentagon, and we were looking at the idea of what if you could have planes that were invisible to radar, we were looking at the effect, and then somebody says, that's not how it works. And I went, oh, this is not a theory. <laughs> <laughs> and, and after that screw up, they said, oh, Jesus. And I said, so then they told me what was going on. And again, once you understand what's going on, you just don't want to go and do a game about it. Oh, man. I, like I said, that's, that's probably one of the best answers I've heard. And on that note, because who knows who's listening, we'll move on to another question. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Da, 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 da. Okay, uh, Scarecrow has asked, what was the most memorable war game convention you've been to? And then if you can explain why. And I love that first one. Uh, oh, you're going to love this one. So this is, this is a long story, but it, it's an amusing story. And it's got a lot of interesting people in it. So the third Origins was at Widener College and was the only one that SPI ever ran. That I, They may have run another one, but that was the first one we ever ran. And because I was 22 and the biggest guy in the company, I was head of security. Ooh. <laughs> so, and when, when, just, to, just to make this very clear, what that means is my job was to make sure that nobody stole stuff from the hall where all the exhibitors were. Yeah, because you got these tables and I got the games and, you know. So then it turns out there's this guy, he had a company in Pennsylvania. His name was David. You know, like David Cassiano or Catalano or something like that. And uh, David owned S owed SPI a bunch of advertising money that he never paid us. And you got to remember, Richard Berg's a lawyer. Mm. Cassiano, I, oh, let's call him Cassiano for now. I can't remember his name. <laughs> Sounds uh, good. And he had some really weird games like, you know, Slave Girls of Venus or shit. I mean, he had some weird stuff. <laughs> but the pictures were great. He had these two girls that were all, you know, wrestling in the picture. I don't know what's going on. So, so now... Um, Cassiano's there, and Berg writes up the paper so we can we can subpoena him in New York. He's in New York. Weiner College is on Staten Island, so he's in New York. And I was going out with this very sweet girl. She's about she might have been all of four eleven, weighed maybe eighty five pounds. Little girl had a very sweet little voice, and uh, her name was Donna Marie Jovanello. And so Donna Marie, I go to Donna Marie. So look, I need you to walk up to this guy, ask him his name and then serve him these papers. <laughs> and of course, me and this guy, Manny Milkune, are really nearby, so in case he goes after her, you know, he's going down, but, so she's literally, she goes, hello, are you there, Cassiano? He goes, yes, he goes, these are for you, and she walks away, and he goes, so now he's been served. Right. So we served him. So that lunch hour, we close down the hall so people can go get dinner, and you know, get lunch, and I'm watching the door, and Cassiano pulls up with his car, he goes, I'm taking my stuff out of here. I said, look, you're not getting it, doesn't open to one o'clock. You can't do nothing to one o'clock. You can't go into one o'clock. He goes, I'm going in. I said, you're not going in. <laughs> so he, he has a car and you have to understand this is like a, um, like an administrative building, but they've got these gigantic um, stone pillars, big, you know, I mean, you know, almost wider than I am, you know, big stone pillars and these arches going to the door and he backs his car to run me over. <laughs> but, I can see that the distance between the pillars is less than the width of the car. So he comes running at me with this car, and I jump back, and he slams into the building. Of course, everybody's laughing at him and stuff. And so he and I are not friends. So anyway, he gets his stuff. And anyway, 1 o'clock, his car's all bashed up. He comes in at 1 o'clock, takes all his stuff, and he leaves. So now, fast forward two years, and I'm at a store, and I used to make a lot of money uh, at SPR. My extra money came from selling games at game conventions. Mm. So there's a Star Trek convention in the Pennsylvania Hotel on 7th Avenue in Manhattan, which is like really easy to get to. So I'm at the Star Trek convention, and the story is 
you know, right next to the SPI booth, I'm selling like all of our space games. We didn't have many, but we had like, uh, our, I forget all the names. You know, we had uh, Battlestar Mars or something, Battleship Mars or something like that. Anyway, we had a whole bunch of these games and we're selling them. And right next to me is Isaac Asimov's uh, science fiction magazine has just started out. And Isaac Asimov, the Isaac Asimov, is in the booth. Sweet. Isaac Asimov, most people don't know, was a real hound dog. And I have this really, I have this other Italian girlfriend now, <laughs> and who, by the way, is, in the, is my wife for 40 years, by the way. Oh. So, so Isaac Asimov starts hitting on Carol. And, you know, and I, I'm amused by it, but more importantly, I get to talk to Isaac Asimov. I won't go into that whole, that's another whole story. But now, let me fast forward to that evening. I'm um, there with Carol, Isaac Asimov, we're getting in the world shutting down our booze, right? And it's now in the hall, pretty much, is Isaac Asimov. Carol and I, and David Cassiano, who, by the way, I'm 6'1", David maybe 5'4". And he's wearing a cardigan sweater, which is very important. So David Cassiano goes, Herman, get out of here. I'm going to kick your... <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And I got my girlfriend there, so I just walk out in the hall, and I fold my arms and goes, you got the first move, dude. <laughs> so now, this is the part that's hysterical. David tries to take off his cardigan sweater to beat me up. He gets caught up in the sweater. <laughs> I'm literally for 12 or 13 seconds, he can't get the sweater off. His arms are pinned out. He finally gets his foot on the sweater and pulls it, and I'm just standing there. I could have killed him. You know, his arms are pinned. He's pinned his arms down. Isaac Asimov's is watching this, and, and he gets the sweater off. He goes, and his shirt's out. He's all crazy. And he goes, you had enough? I go, yes. And he walks away. <laughs> and the best moment of my life, Isaac Asimov says, I have to put that into a book. <laughs> now, did he get it in? I don't know. I don't think so. He died. You know, but, but I got to tell you, when Isaac Asimov looks at you approvingly, you, oh. you, have, you have reached your pinnacle in life. <laughs> that, that is pretty. And Greg actually says, hi, Carol, internet rock star. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell her. She, <laughs> she'll love that. Perfect segue on that. Man, that is, I, you just, yeah, you're hanging out with Isaac Asimov, and he says he's got to put it in a book. I tell you, the funniest thing he said to me, I was talking to him, you know, he was there for the whole, you know, weekend. He was trying to, you know, get this magazine going. And I says, you know, so like a dumbass, like I go to him, I go, hey, you know, I notice in your books that like at the end of your books, it really accelerates and you know, like the goes go slow and then all of a sudden accelerates. I said, so is that like a technique? He goes, he says, son, let me explain this to you. They tell me they want a 350 page book. I put 350 pages to the left of the typewriter. I start typing. All of a sudden I go, ooh, I better finish the book. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding. I swear to God, that's what he told me. Ah. <laughs> wow. I mean, this guy was, he was really something, but he was just, <laughs> that would crack me up. Oh, God. See, that is a tidbit that everybody in here is just happy they heard. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. Let's see. That was a great thank you, Scarecrow, for the question. Let's see. We've got uh, Mike D. Uh, he says, hey, hey to everybody that's even uh, in the comments, but Mark, uh, where do you see war gaming going in the next few years, given the rise in recent years of card-driven uh, slash me uh, mechanisms, and what do you foresee might be the next revolution in board gaming? Now, if you can pick out the revolution, that's that's really good. Well, I, well, well, the thing that I think so the revolution, but I will go. I'll, let me first talk about technology. I think that one of the things that I've seen which really could change our lives is not virtual reality. You know what the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality is? Yes. Yeah, like Pokemon uses augmented where they'll put the, the character like virtually Correct. into a real space. Correct. So imagine we get to a place where we can play a physical board game in augmented reality. Like you could be in Wichita and you go, hey, and we can be playing games where we're actually picking up pieces, not computer games, actually playing physical games. And I think that that ultimately could be the next revolution in game. Forget about war game. Now, as to, you know, war gaming, I, I think that, let me talk about, you know, my good friend Volko Runke and the coin system. One of the things I learned from you know watching what Volko did with the coin games, which I love, but you know I did part in the lake with him, and he's, he's an orc, and I love what's going on with that. Is I was always into a hand of cards, 
you know, so, you know, card, you know, I, I like a hand of cards. It's kind of how I like having the combination. Where coin games, and coin games are just as hard to play as any card driven game. But what's interesting to me is by getting into the hand of cards and just having you look at two cards, everybody looking at the same two cards, the complexity of the, of the decision space drops rather dramatically. And I think that that's, that's kind of what I think people are looking for is this textured narrative, which has always been important. And I think that, you know, cards are, you know, did you see um, Ken Burns's um, Vietnam series or I, I, War One or any of them? I love Ken Burns. The only one I haven't seen is Vietnam. Okay, well, you should see it, by the way. But what I and I realized, by the way, that Ken Burns did the American Civil War. I did for the people. He did the Pacific. I did Empire of the Sun, and then he did Vietnam. I did Fire in the Lake. So I've been following. I unconsciously, we're on the same path so far. He uses <clears throat> in video. They're telling stories in segments, right? You know, it's, here's a segment, here's a segment, and they put that all together, and it's a brilliant story. What I find that cards or that mechanism does is we're doing the same thing. The card is a story, just like any one of the section of a movie. And so the cards are, and, and what happens in the coin series is that that story is just going frame by frame that you're getting to interact with, but it's just like a movie. It's different than a hand of cards. And so... I appreciate that that you know the beauty of it. Now of course people love hands of cards because look at the you know the power of Twilight Struggle. People really get to under you know really get to you know there are people who are just brilliant players at it and they focus on it just like people focus on chess. So that's really getting somewhere. Um, so when I think about the future of Wargaming, you know, the traditional hex encounter, I mean that I've been learning how to play you ever play Creed or uh, Total Krieg or Axis Empires? Um, I no, I have not played them. You gotta talk to Greg. I know Greg has. Yes. So uh, GMT has Unconditional Surrender: War in Europe, and that is sort of like the fourth in that saga. You know, that's the tree of, of you know continuity. Sal used to work on the uh, various Creed games. Also a good friend and great guy. Uh, so that is a classic. X encounter game, but what I find is <clears throat> people are trying to strip out the. You know, well, people love some micro. There are a whole group that loves micromanagement. People want to strip out the micromanagement and get down to the beef. And I think that that's kind of where gaming is going. Is you know, how do we, you know, really create this great story, but really strip out the the stuff that slows things down. And I think that that's kind of where gaming is going. But I think that you throw that on with the augmented reality, and I think again, people want to hear that that story. Hmm. And I've got a, a question that actually came in when I did the announcement. And uh, Jesper Arikiel said he wasn't sure he'd be able to come in, but he said, um, let's see, his question was, if I could ask you about the next installment of the Great Statesman series, the two games uh, so far are some of his group's favorites, and he'd heard rumors um, I think it's about a Versailles Treaty is what he's got on here. Yeah, so there is. So there's a guy named Jeff Engelstein who's uh, also a well. He did the Expanse recently. He's a great guy. Yeah, I know Jeff. And Jeff and I are teaming up on Versailles 1919. But Versailles 1919, while getting done, is not a great state team series game. But it's really turning into a very cool game. More in lines of what I think is, you know, and cutting out the chrome and getting down to the essence of a really cool situation. Um, I would say that uh, the next game in the Great Statesman series that I think uh, will come down, but it's going to be a while, is um, Continental Congress. Hmm. Uh, I, I'm, really, I'm really fascinated by what was the role of the Continental Congress in actually winning the war? What hmm. was the role of the Parliament in losing the war? In more detail, and so I'm starting to look down that road. Um, but so I, I, I tell uh, the nice man, was it was Jasper. You said his name was. Uh, yeah, Jasper, I think. Jasper. Anyway, I tell that, that nice man that uh, I'm very happy that he likes Pericles and Churchill, and you know, keep playing. It'll be a while for that, you know, for that to come back. Well, and I, reading your uh, your blog, I noticed that you'd won 
told you were telling well people when you ran into that Churchill you did not consider as a war game it was a game that you designed but I know it got kind of put out as hey here's another war game that Mark's done you, you know Judd one thing about Judd is I, I, I appreciate that he actually knows how to read uh, and the first four words on the back of the Churchill box says Churchill is not oh, it's five words Churchill is not a war game <laughs> right. uh, I mean I, I, I think that I I mean, I know people say that I'm not clear when I speak, and I, I but I think that's pretty clear. Right? <laughs> I don't know where you go with that, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how clear I can be about uh, about it, uh, because it's not about the war. It's about how you, you know, it's the political side of how do you win, how do you win a piece in your favor is what the game is about, which is the title. Uh, the war part is just how you keep score in the end. And I, I, it's amazing. Um, the, the thing that I did in Churchill that created a level of nerd rage, I call it, somebody else coined that phrase, but I love it, nerd rage. Sure. The level of nerd rage that rose out of the idea that if you're heading up a coalition of two countries versus one, and your combined score is more than the guy in first place, but the guy in second is going to win because he's head of a bigger coalition. That set off a storm that was just epic in my mind. There were people who just freaked the hell out uh, because you're telling me that the guy in second place wins. And said, no, I never said that. You said that. <laughs> that's how they see it. And it's just like, oh, my God. And you, you would think that I had desecrated a religion. <laughs> Which I would never do, but it's right. amazing. But I, I know, uh, well, heck, it might even have been Judd that I was talking to that said uh, when he'd met you and talked to you that you you just put forth the game and, uh, you know, kind of very much like a, like a prolific author. I mean, you've got 71, 72 games out there. You, you create the game and then you send it out. And... And I, I love the factor of how do you get inside that headspace of it being, you know, completely different. Or when you started up with car driven, uh, you know, you said you'd thrown away, you know, what you'd worked on and then you reconfigured into the cards with We The People. What, how do you work around in that headspace? Well, actually I have a very, it's actually much simpler. It's the simplest thing in the world. If I don't want, if I'm not, if I'm not, you know, fanatically wanting to play it, why would you? So when I do, I do a lot of games that would, they're professional, believe me, they have rules, they have pieces, you know, they, they work. But I'm not excited, and if I'm not excited, and so what excites me is not going down the same path over and over and over again. I want it to be fresh, and that freshness is what I assume some people like about my stuff, and it's also the same reason why most people don't like my stuff because it's not familiar. If each, you know, uh, and then some people say your games are too. I have a friend, uh, old friend uh, named Doug Wadley, and he said somebody said to him once, "You know, Mark's game is really complicated." He just did, and he goes, "Just wait, the next one will be simple, will <laughs> be complicated." So after Pericles, I did Fort Sumter, and where is? It? Let me see something here. Sure. So these are marked up, but these are all of the, this is a small rule booklet and the, it's, it's eight pages of that size. This is not a normal, it's a half size. Those are all the rules. So I, I can't make them simpler than that. So, and I just did one for Roger McGowan. It's going to have like one page of rules. So wow. I'm not for complexity or against complexity, but what I find fascinating, by the way, people always focus on the complexity and I go, you know, uh, you know, as a, you know, having taken a lot of physics, you know, time is time, you, you know, at our speed, right? You know, you're not going, you know, we're not going to do the theory of relativity here, but an hour of time is an hour of time. So when people say, well, the game's really complex, the answer is, yeah, but it takes two hours to play. You know, so well, the zero game's easy, and it takes four hours to play. Yeah, but that's four hours. This is two hours. Complexity is does not equal time to play. Those are not, they're, and people look at them as equivalents. And I think that that is, if I had to say that there's something that frustrates me about, you know, the people in our tribe is that's how they look at life. If it's complex, it takes more time. And the answer is no. 
upon his time. You know, I create scenarios like Pericles has seven or eight scenarios that take two hours or less. I haven't played a Euro game that takes two hours. Or I just played, uh, what is it called, uh, Asgard and his Great Western Trail. And, and, and they're, they're interesting games. They take four or five hours to play. Right. People say, oh, I, I, my group plays it faster. All right, so now you take three hours. Well, <laughs> I can play Empire of the Sun in three hours. So, you know, you know, so complexity has nothing to do with time to play. So I find that the, the, the arguments are, are ludicrous. You know, it's just you like what you like. You know, you like, you like worker placement games and play worker placement games. You know, but don't tell me that it's less complex. It took us the rule booklet for uh, this Asgard game, which is a very interesting game. I like the North, North mythology. It, we now played three times. I think we finally, on the third try, we finally played it correctly. That's how miserable, and it's got, you know, lots of pictures, and it's got few, it's just, it's a miserable um, way to learn how to play a game. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have a lot of pages. It can't be that complex. Well, the answer is, no, it took us three games. I, I play most games I learned how to play in one try. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, it was painful. Now, as a, as a designer, do you, do you occasionally just box up a game, put it on your, your, you know, work in progress shelf, and then, you know, three months later, something hits, and you're like, ooh, that'll work, that'll work. Um, that has happened. Um, I, I guess I, you know, I guess I've gotten better at this. So I would um, I'm always working on about 10 games at once. Wow. And in time, one just seems like it wants to be, happen. And yeah, I guess the other ones are sitting back, and I reevaluate them. But, but it's just like I've always got, you know, I've got. I don't know what I'm working on. I got so many things I'm working on these days. Uh, but you know, they slowly, you know, it's eventually they want to be born, and they they do. No, I I feel you there. Now, saying ten games at once, is there anything that you can tease, or do you not want to get into that? Oh, I'm happy with that. Uh, you know, I'm doing a um, a. So you you heard of great battles of history, and obviously. You know, uh, there's command and colors, but you know that's so. I'm actually taking my great battles of history, and I'm basically boiling it down to a 20-minute battles, mm. but not using that. But no, car, well, there's some but cards. It's not card driven. It's uh, dice driven. I I really like that. Um, I always like custom dice. You know that you roll dice and. I got a kind of a neat little mechanic, but all that history that I've got in the Great Battles, I'm going to translate into this, and it's going to have little uh, miniatures. So I'm kind of excited about that. I'm doing, um, oh, France 44 is being redone by Compass, uh, and we'll do the companion Russian version also afterwards. So that's, you know, starting to percolate. And of course, is the expansion to Fire in the Lake is the thing that's closest that I'm working on now that Fort Sumter is finally going down the quay. What, what I find is, by the way, people say, you know, what, what are you working on? When a game is in production, as I was telling you earlier, the amount of work it takes to, you know, I love when people go, this wasn't play tested. Who proofread this thing? You're stupid. You're ugly. Okay, I got that. Uh, but, I mean, I just put 80 hours into uh, the playbook and the rule booklet for, and I've had help for Fort Sumter, you know, just to get it ready for it. Everybody is a, a lot of work, and so I haven't been doing anything uh, but doing that. So no game has moved forward in the last two weeks. Now yeah. that's done, I'll go back to uh, Fall of Saigon. Will be the next thing I'm really going to focus on, and I continue to work on the improvements to the uh, the bot for uh, Empire of the Sun because I like Empire of the Sun, so I'm always working on that. Beautiful. Now I'm going to tell all the commenters. I may not get to every comment, so no offense to anybody. I may have missed it or looked over it. I'm going to try to I'll go through a couple of these rapid, and you've even answered some of them. Somebody want to know if you ever play Euro games. You've already answered that. Um, Greg uh, Schmickens throws in complexity isn't just, quote, time to play. It's often, it often, or sorry, now I messed it up. He'll be mad at me. Often, it is, quote, time to learn. Yeah, but um, I, well, I, I would just respond to Greg is that part of the fun to me. I mean, I love, you know, getting into – you know, a new headspace. So I just, that's part of the love, you know, that's part of what I love about games. I've got Danny in here who happens to be a New Jersey constable. He's, he's busting me like only a cop can. Um, we'll skip over what Danny's saying. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Uh, Al Foy, just, he wants to say thanks. Your games have provided him with a lot of uh, enjoyment over the years. I, I got to tell you, I, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, I, I got to tell you that uh, I am truly uh, humbled and appreciative about what everybody's done for me. You know, people say you design these games and I really spent my time and I love them. But I got to tell you, I love the fact that you guys want to play them and that you're so nice about it. So it's, it's the love goes both ways. You know, thanks. There you go. Uh, here might be a quick, easy one to answer uh, from uh, Sergian or uh, Sergian. Hello, idiot. Sergeant Rock. Jeez. Wow. What am I doing? How do you come up that. with. Yeah, I love Sergeant Rock. How do you come up with or how did you come up with the name Fire in the Lake? Now, I, I've kind of heard of that, but how did you come up with it? Oh, it's. Uh, I can pull it up. I mean, we have a time, but it's a very famous book. Uh, it's the title of a very famous book, and it was the book that I felt best represented how I was looking at the problem. Uh, it's by Frances Fitzgerald, if I remember. I think that's her name. Uh, but tell them to look it up. It's a very famous book. I read it when I was in college. Perfect. Let's see. Some questions for the group at large have come in. Uh, uh, do you plan to design more semi-cooperative games? Yes, I, I am, you know, having worked in the real world Pentagon and State Department, it is interesting to me, you know, how messy decisions are. And I find that, that to be, I'm fascinated by that. So hmm. I, I continue to, uh, you know, what I call co-opetition. I'll do more of that. I, I enjoy it. Beautiful. Um, in Morlino, do you attempt to compute the decision space for your designs? Um, so I certainly always look at the decision space, but what I do do, I get it, I give the example of Fort Sumter. Uh, I uh, had a friend and I, we built a Monte Carlo simulation of the cards and using the computer, we played, um, a hundred thousand games of Fort Sumter, which is 600,000 hands of cards. Wow. And I was able to tune the deck so that I knew that. Out of a hundred, out of six thousand hands, which is represents you know uh, two thousand games, only five of the hands out of six thousand were what I would call difficult hands. You know, so I really, so I do a lot of um, standard simulation stuff on card decks because there's a lot of math around that. Uh, because you know, just to give you an example, like in, in Empire of the Sun, each of the two decks will generate. 4.529 billion um, combinations on just the Japanese or the American deck. When you combine that, you're into trillions. There's no other way to do it. I mean, I, I can't play test it enough. You know, people go, you didn't play test it enough. Well, I, I can't live that long. So <laughs> I had to do it, you know, with computers to really suss out that nothing's going to blow up. So that, that as far as, is that what, that's what he means. That, that, and I do do a lot of that. But beyond that, um, a lot of it is also art. You know, there's a, what decisions I want you to make. And uh, one of the things I also do is, if you want to know what decisions, I, I'm very big on that you're in the narrative of you are MacArthur or you are Churchill. And if you read their memoirs, they tell you what they were thinking about. So I try to put in the game, what were they thinking? Not what I'm thinking about, what were they thinking about? And that's this is how I do the decision space. Maybe that's helpful to his question. Yeah. Very much so. Now I know I won't keep you. We're at 8.03. I'll bring in one last uh, comment. And then I'll thank you. And anything you want to add in, or anything uh, you want to mention on your do this again your, anytime you want. I, I'm, you know, Sunday nights are always quiet. Cool, I love it. Uh, let's see, we got a great one from uh, Coach Ace One Two Three. After hearing Mark's Isaac Asimov story, he's three level three levels higher in my quote cool rating. Where is Judd when I rate Mark H higher? Question mark. I don't know. I don't know where to go with that one. Yeah, yeah. So you're 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 elevating your Asimov story as his stratosphere, do you, I believe? Well, I will tell you one of the things, you know, I did fire the lake. What was interesting to me was, you know, I was it was a privilege. A lot of the people that used to work for me were Vietnam vets. And I heard their stories. So a lot of the cards in, in Fire in the Lake are some of them are actually, you know, versions of their story. You know, my version of, you know, John Ken Burns movie. And I actually met almost everybody, all the famous people other than the president. I actually met them all. Mm. Them. So 
you know, Kissinger and uh, Bob Comer. I mean, so I actually met and knew these people. And so I feel like I was able to, you know, I was a big fan of Second Secretary Schlesinger and, you know, he's passed on, obviously. What a wonderful guy. But I never forgot, I was, I was with Schlesinger at a dinner once. And you had, Schlesinger had a really raw sense of humor. And he was telling me about this in 1973, uh, you know, during the average Israeli war, um, you know, the Russians started doing some things that disturbed us. You know, we went to DEF CON 2 and all this. And he's telling me the story. He goes, he gets a call from the White House. And he goes, Henry, you need to calm down. <laughs> and I'm going, he's talking about Henry Kissinger. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he was an amazing guy. Uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, we're, uh, we're, I'm definitely, as long as you're willing, I'm going to have you back on. I could ask 50 questions and, and just try to get more of those stories out. Love it. There are some, I've met, I've worked with the most, I'll tell you my last story. This is my last story for the night and we'll let you go. So I worked with the most amazing man ever named Admiral Sobrowski. And he and I, uh, he, he was a, uh, a vice admiral, became you know, provost of the Naval War College. And he, for a time, you know what the great eagle is in the Navy? Mm, no, unless it's a senior admiral or something. Uh, it is the oldest aviator in the Navy. Oh. Eagle, And they actually give you this, you, and you only hold on to this thing while you're still in, and usually nobody is the great eagle for more than like a year because you're usually at the very end of your career and the last guy retired and they give it to you and then you retire and you get the next guy. So Sobrowski was the great eagle. I was with him and, um, you know, and, you know, he was just an amazing guy. And then sadly he got, you know, cancer and he passed away. So it's Halloween about two years after he died and the DOD randomly reassigns phone numbers. So I'm going into this facility, and I was outside, and they were trying to see if I was in the parking lot. So from some phone inside this facility, they dial me up. But my smartphone knows numbers, and it comes up, and it's Halloween. I'm with the guy who used to be his aide. Admiral Sobrowski is calling you on Halloween. I'm going, dude, <laughs> dead. <laughs> and I'm going, I, I think I need to take this call. <laughs> and of course, it was a guy. So randomly, Sobrowski's number got given to some random phone in this facility. The guy who wanted to see where I was just grabbed the phone, called me, and the phone goes, oh, it's Admiral Sobrowski. And I'm going like, wow. So, you know, I've known a lot of great men. Uh, I can talk a lot. Of, I can talk about uh, Tom Rona, and I can talk about, you know, all these guys. But it was an amazing experience. And, and for some strange reason, they took a shine to a young guy with way too much confidence for his, his brain power. And they trained me, and they taught me stuff. It was beyond college and graduate school. So I, I, I have been blessed by that experience. I can't even tell you. And Isaac Asimov was, you know, the least of it, but he was cool. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, this happened real quick. I reached out to you, and you're like, "How about tomorrow?" I'm like, "Let's do it." All right, I like that. I know, me too. It was move, move, move. Go, go, go. So thank you very much. Thanks to all the fans that chimed in. Sorry I couldn't get to all your questions. Uh, Mark's already said uh, we'll, we'll probably do this again. So uh, come on back, and, uh, and I'm going to take us off live right now. Thanks again, Mark. Thanks. Hang on even after I take us off here. Sure. And there's always a 